Hello, everyone. Let's talk about social inclusion again. Canada, 1850. An indigenous community, the Anishinaabe Nation, signed the Robinson Treaties. We'll get there very soon. Promising annual annuity that have not been increased in the past um, 150 years. And today, with my guest, Tenille Brown, uh, we explored together a recent uh, Ontario decision uh, brought by the Anishinaabe treaty beneficiaries who seek to affirm these treaty rights. And so we discussed today how this decision could lead to um, the implementation of reconciliation through Indigenous law and also an opportunity to develop um, in Canada in which Indigenous peoples are true partners in development and management of natural resources. We'll jump into it uh, in a minute. Tanil, welcome to our episode. Hi, thanks for having me. Tanil, your study overall uh, argues that a specific court case, Restul uh, versus Canada decision, you will tell us more about this soon. It tells us that this court case is important because it has the potential to change the way that Canada responds to and respects its treaty obligations. And it demonstrates a growing movement to revitalize indigenous law and indigenous legal systems. Is this correct? Is this the main core importance of your research? That's correct. So we're talking about um, a decision that was heard a couple of years ago in Ontario, Restore Against Canada, mm -hmm. um, and then it's been heard in appeal, and then it's been heard, uh, it will be heard at the Supreme Court of Canada in November. So it's an ongoing conversation, um, but it concerns the treaty. And so the treaty, uh, the two treaties are the Robinson treaties, as you said, um, and they're concluded 100 plus years ago. Um, and it's the terms of the treaty remain unfulfilled. Um, and the particular um, piece that this case looks at is the annuity um, uh, clause. So in um, uh, treaties concluded in the 19th century um, in Canada, um, we have some historical numbered treaties, we have the Robertson treaties, there would be an annual annuity payment that would be given to uh, Indigenous uh, beneficiaries um, in um, uh, return for um, relations, ongoing relations, these kinds of things, recognition of the relationships. Um, the annuity amount in the Robertson Treaties is unclear. Um, and that's the, that's the issue in the case. Um, it indicates a certain amount of um, a couple of dollars, uh, but it also indicates that the amount will increase um, dependent upon the resource revenues that the government receives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's a unique clause. Um, the impacts, the potential for that is... Uh, uh, has the potential to alter relationships uh, between the Canadian state and Indigenous communities. Um, it is an annuity clause that indicates engagement with government activities around resource um, extraction. Um, so this case is important to for the beneficiaries of the treaties. And for me, I'm I'm in um, on the treaty lands here of the Robertson Superior Treaty. Um, and it's important for Canadian approaches to interpreting treaties mm -hmm. across Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, you touched upon uh, this uh, a bit in your introduction now. So what was the specific research gap that made you do this? Was more research on uh, Indigenous law and its potential applications in a variety of contexts? What, what was the research gap here? So I was just saying that I believe that we have an obligation to learn about the treaties that we are on. Um, this case um, speaks to a gap in the law, an area that has not been properly implemented, properly researched. Um, and we have this case coming through that we need to have attention to. Mm -hmm. The interesting piece about this case is that the law that was argued in it is entirely Canadian law. Mm -hmm. So in Canada, we have common law and we have civil law in Quebec. Um, and then constitutionally, there is Aboriginal law. So this is codified in the Canadian Constitution. At the same time, there exists Indigenous law in Canada. 
Um, so this was decimated um, through colonization. Uh, and in recent years, there's been a re revitalization of it and attempts of uh, working towards that. Um, and in this decision, the parties did not argue Indigenous law. Mm -hmm. They argued Aboriginal law, mm -hmm. but they used, and I write about this in the paper, they used Indigenous law and procedure, Indigenous governance, uh, throughout the hearings of the case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we saw that they had um, uh, uh, sacred fires burning during the course of the court hearing. Um, we saw that the court hearing was not just in the courthouse, it was also in the, the community. So it was a traveling um, sort of hearing. Um, and we saw that the rules around uh, um, taking evidence from elders, knowledge keepers, um, so important um, uh, in Indigenous communities. Uh, rules for taking evidence from elders was um, uh, altered a little bit to make it more of an culturally um, appropriate uh, um, hearing, less adversarial um, and more um, uh, working together. So I believe that this case uh, is worthy of attention because it gives us a possibility of having Indigenous law be present mm -hmm. um, as procedure, um, even when Aboriginal law or Canadian um, uh, law is being argued. Sure. Mm -hmm. You have given us here, um, spice the curiosity, um, even as a settler in the area. Let us know the one, two main conclusions, main highlights uh, of the research before we jump into also an interesting part, which is the policy implications of this. So what are the main highlights of your study? So I think the first is, as I've um, uh, expressed a little bit, the first main uh, uh, highlight is this idea that we can have Indigenous law as procedure. And so that's not to, to um, suggest that um, Indigenous law should only be utilized as procedure in a case. Ultimately, we need to have full revitalization of Indigenous legal systems. So it's not to suggest that that is the only approach, but it is an attempt to recognize that we have a uh, multiple sophisticated and complex strategies that can be pursued in the course of claiming rights. Mm -hmm. um, so that finding, I think, is something that we need to think about uh, in the legal community. Um, and we think about colonialism and its impacts uh, um, and how we can revitalize indigenous systems in a truly meaningful way. Um, so that's one piece um, that I would point to. Um, a second piece that I would point to is this legal matter is ongoing. So the Supreme Court is going to be hearing the decision in November, so hearing an appeal of the lower court's findings. Um, and the lower court's findings were positive towards the Indigenous beneficiaries. So the lower courts found that there was an obligation to pay the annuity mm -hmm. and that there was an obligation to increase the annuity and that this increase was to be calculated in some way related to um, the resource revenue that had been generated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's an important Takeaway is ongoing. We have to have attention to that and we have to think about this as an opportunity for engagement in resource revenues um, by persons that are in the treaty lands and, and particularly the treaty beneficiaries. Um, so that's a significant uh, piece. A third takeaway, it's a bit legal. I'm not sure if people want to hear it. It's a, it's a little legal point in Canada, um, but there was a standard of treaty review uh, treaty, pardon me, treaty interpretation at the um, lower courts that was taken um, and the on appeal, the treaty uh, interpretation principles took a lesser standard. 
Um, and so I have concerns about how treaty interpretation might mm -hmm. look moving forward. And we, we want to have strong treaty interpretation principles and we want to defer to those uh, to those judges and those decisions when they've done all this work of being in communities and hearing complex hearings, mm -hmm. um, complex testimonies from elders, etc. Mm -hmm. These uh, these three allies that you mentioned may be a bit curious. You've touched upon this as well about uh, potential practical implications of these. As you said, the legal process is ongoing. You said uh, this twice already. So, um, in your opinion. Uh, in practical terms, what can come in the future? So what's uh, well, potential policy implications of these in the future? So um, it's Ontario that's appealing it to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And their concern right now is precisely how to calculate the increase in the annuity payments. Mm -hmm. And Ontario um, uh, believes and argues that the uh, calculations of revenues um, is a policy matter for the government government. And so whilst they concede that, yes, the Ontario government will increase annuity payments, the calculation of that is for the government, and it's not um, something that can be calculated through this idea of um, uh, looking at the revenues. So, mm -hmm. uh, um, mm -hmm. so that difference is significant, because it's a difference which would indicate either on the one hand uh, close engagement with resource extraction, uh, partnerships in revenues, uh, and the possibilities there for greater um, uh, 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 partnerships around resource management um, on the one hand versus on the other hand the government continuing to maintain uh, a singular control over resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the potential for a policy perspective, uh, from a policy perspective, the potential of uh, having um, greater engagement in uh, greater engagement, partnership, respect for generation of resource revenues as a matter of treaty interpretation um, would be um, a, a forward looking um, and very innovative um, approach if that were to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay. And parallel to um, well, the legal process and the uh, potential implications in society and in politics, uh, scholarly speaking, so what's left to study? More case studies like this one? Uh, more case studies. We need to pay attention to what's happening in the um, legal community with this decision. Um, and then we need to think about how that's going to impact treaties across Canada. Um, a, a separate research avenue is um, the trial decision occurred over hundreds of days. Um, the elders gave testimony mm -hmm. um, and protocol was adopted um, to allow test elders to testify in a culturally appropriate way. And there was a court hearing that allowed for the elder testimony to be recorded and posted online. So there is an archive of all of the elder testimonies. And in these testimonies, um, uh, elders are essentially sharing Indigenous law. So there is a recorded hundreds of hours of oral history um, around Indigenous law that uh, needs to be um, uh, maintained. The archive needs to maintain be maintained. But I foresee a lot of work being done to um, uh, consider uh, the, to record, consider that Indigenous law. Mm -hmm. It's it's a powerful resource. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, just a note also to our listeners uh, about the Supreme Court decision uh, that Tanil mentioned uh, in November, correct? If I if I heard it correctly. Uh, we are recording this in September 2023, so that our listeners have uh, indication of time. Tanil, can you provide uh, some additional resources about uh, the topic discussed today? So I would point um, uh, anyone who's interested, I would point them to looking up at these archives, uh, taking mm -hmm. a few minutes to listen to some elder testimony. There there are hundreds of hours, um, so it would be an undertaking to listen to all of mm -hmm. it. Um, the uh, URLs for that are, are in my work, um, uh, so you can find all the resources for that. Um, and I, 
I would also um, secondly urge um, uh, people to read the decision, read the decision from the lower courts and then and see um, uh, uh, what the Supreme Court releases in November of 2023. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Tanil, let's wrap this episode up. So if there is anything you want our audience to remember about this talk in one, two sentences, what would it be? I um, would urge um, listeners to undertake an exercise, which is when they are visiting uh, Canada, they are in Canada, um, working, holidaying, whatever they're doing, visiting family, um, to look up the treaty lands that they are on. Mm-hmm. That is the takeaway from the restore decision. It's the takeaway from the research. Look up the treaty and read the treaty. Mm-hmm. Um, knowing that is reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Straight to the point. Daniel, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. For our listeners that are watching us on YouTube, you can find uh, all the resources, the archive materials that Tanil mentioned, and the article that served as base uh, for this conversation in the Let's Talk About Social Inclusion website. Alternatively, you can also listen to this episode wherever you get your podcast, and you can follow us on Twitter. We are at Cogitatio LTA.